Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. If you're one of my newer listeners who haven't got to listen to a lot of my older videos, you're in for a treat today because I'm going over one of the Women of Marvel podcasts. And I'm going to talk about the new Black Widow series that's coming out a little bit, but the creators of this series mostly. And a lot of people ask me, why in the world do you listen to that garbage? Well, it's because mainly it's run by Sana Amanon. She produces it and actually is one of the interviewers in most of these. And she's the top person at Marvel. You know, I just listened to a two-hour podcast done by C.B. Sobolski. And yeah, he's really not in charge. He's in charge of the creative people. But Sana Amanon gets to choose who the creative people are. And she she okays all of those people, so really, she's the one in charge. And I do get some good stuff every once in a while out of these podcasts. There was one where San Amanant interviewed this woman. I can't remember her name for the life of me, but she was one of the producers at Marvel Studios, and she gets things done at Marvel Studios. She really gets things done. San Amanant tried to keep pulling her into this social justice kind of language, and she really didn't have much to say about it. She just wants to get things done and produce a good product. And she started off in Marvel Comics, and she got brain drained off into the movie. And that was the point of me going over that podcast because I was saying you should have these people running Marvel Comics right now. If you had a healthy industry, you would have these people not being drained off into another medium, but they would be staying in Marvel Comics. And she would probably, if that happened, be the person who was in charge of Marvel Comics right now and Marvel Comics would be great. And I think in the podcast that I'm going to go over today, we see the exact opposite of what I was saying in that podcast because we have something here which shows that the stuff that Marvel is putting out in its comics is just second tier material. Okay, so we have an interview, if you want to call it that, with these two people, sisters, twins. They refer to themselves as the Saska sisters. So I'm just going to refer to them as that. I'm not even going to bother with their names. They're the Saska sisters. And they have written the new Black Widow miniseries that is coming out soon. And of course, why is there a Black Widow miniseries coming out? Because of course, they have a Black Widow movie coming out and they're using the comics to prep people for a Black Widow solo movie. That's what they're doing. And quite specifically, because the reason why these two sisters got to write this comic was because they are indie movie producers, basically. They produce indie movies in Canada, by the way. And the thing is that they were tapped to write a script for the new Black Widow movie that's coming out. And a number of people were tapped. And kudos to Marvel Studios, by the way, for actually having a competition where they have people, multiple people, submit a script and picking the best one. And theirs was rejected. But someone said, okay, we're going to put out this Black Widow series, this mini series for Marvel. Let's just, since we already have these properties that we requested that they write, let's take one of those. Let's take a progressive one of those written by two women and we'll turn it into our miniseries. So these two women, they have never written a comic before. They said something strange. They said, we have written comic shorts before, but they never actually explained what that was. They said, we wrote comic shorts, but never an actual comic. So what that means, I really don't know. So this is their first attempt at writing a comic. And of course, they get a number one at Marvel with one of their major characters, which is Black Widow. And the point is that they took their screenplay and turned it into this miniseries. They were asked to do so. So what do we have here in Marvel Comics? We have the sloppy seconds of the movies. Quite literally, that's what it is. All they did was revamp their screenplay for the Black Widow movie that they wrote, and they're making it into this miniseries that they're putting in the comics. So one of the reasons why I listened to this was because I did see this around on the Marvel website. They had good art, but again, it's probably just cover art that they're showing you. So what the internal art looks like, you never know. But when I heard about who was writing it, you know, I didn't know who they were. They just said they were movie producers, and they didn't say what kind of movie producers. And I thought to myself, hmm, maybe since they're movie producers, they actually know how to write something good. And even though they've never written a comic before, maybe they actually pick someone good here. And it's Black Widow, and I love Black Widow, just like many people love Black Widow. I remember when she changed over from that look from the 70s in the late 80s, early 90s, you know? I can just picture in my head that Barry Windsor Smith cover with Black Widow and Daredevil. And I can just picture that cover of the X-Men with Black Widow and Wolverine and Captain America on it. I can just picture that entire graphic novel that was drawn by Larry Stroman. Just beautiful stuff that set the tone for the modern Black Widow. 
It's a great character. I love that character. And so I was actually interested in this book. And then I listened to this podcast. Now, I'm sure many of you, like me, listen to a lot of Richard over at Diversity in Comics or Comics Matters or whatever he calls it now. And every once in a while, he comes across this book, which he reads, and he says, you know, I feel awful. I feel sick after having read this book. And honestly, that's how I feel after listening to this podcast. I feel tainted in some way. These people are just horrible. And I don't even want to call it horrible because they're movie producers and they produce horror movies. So to call them horrible people, to call them disturbed people or that they are disturbing, they would probably take that as a compliment. So I'm going to say, and this is truly how I felt at the end of this podcast, that these two people are a bit mentally unhinged. That, I think, is the best way to describe it. And, oh, by the way, Sana Amanat and Judy just love these women. They think they're the bee's knees, that they're nice, touchy-feely, huggy people, and they're the greatest people in the world. And when I go over some of this stuff and talk about how sort of unhinged these people are, that kind of gives you a little bit more insight into Sana Amanat's mind if she thinks they're the greatest people in the world. So before I get to the story, because in order to actually describe the story and how horrible it is, I am going to have to describe what these women talk about in describing themselves. Because in this podcast, which, by the way, I'll put the link in the description for the podcast, and any time I talk about one of these podcasts, if you ever want to go see them, just go over to the Marvel website. They have them all posted under podcasts. And so in this podcast, usually you get Sana Aminat and Judy actually controlling it a little bit and asking questions. Oh, no, these two women, these Saska sisters, they take over. Sana Amana and Judy barely get a word in edgewise here. So they are just speaking almost constantly through the 35 minutes of this interview. And I'll have to start here and say this. Of a 35-minute interview, I have never heard the word power used more within half an hour. And it's usually in the terms of empowerment. Oh, they love that word. They stick it in everywhere. They say it over and over and over again. And because... They are progressive, quote unquote. These are people who are just like San Amanat. And, you know, San Amanat went and found them, I'm sure, because San Amanat, in her search for unique voices that she always claims, is simply looking for people who think exactly the same way she does. Because, of course, that's unique, right? So the thing is about these two sisters and their constant use of the word empowerment, you know, I have to point out, they're Canadian. All right. So if you haven't spent a lot of time in Canada, because I did another one of these podcasts and talked about Marika Tamaki and she's Canadian as well. And you can see their language, both Marika Tamaki and these two Saska sisters, they're almost identical language that they use. Because if you just spend most of your time in the good old US of A and from the analytics of my channel, that's who my main audience is. If you're one of those people and you're looking at these SJWs everywhere around you now and shaking your head at them, oh, wait till you take a look at Canada because Canada doesn't have SJWs. It has SJWs 3.0 because it's been around there for a long, long time. I mean, it's part of the curriculum for grade school students. And I'm not joking. I used to do research and part of the research that I had to do a while ago was about 10 years or more, I think, ago. I had to compare curriculums from around North America and three of the curriculums that I looked at were from three different provinces of Canada because they have provinces and not states. And if you look at their health and social studies curriculum, because they don't have civics, they got rid of civics in the 70s, I think it was. If you look at these programs, they spend entire years of their programs teaching grade school children about empowerment. And empowerment is just cultural Marxist language. That's all it is. They took Marxism, where you have your class struggle between the oppressed and the oppressor, between your bourgeoisie and proletariat, and they said, that doesn't work anymore, so we have to switch up the names. So they now have a class struggle between men and women, or between white people and non-white people, or between Christians and non-Christians. They just switched up the names. It's just cultural Marxism, because you have these oppressed people, which are the women, or the non-white people, or the non-Christian people. They are the oppressed. And how do they get what they deserve in this life? Well, they get what they deserve in this life by being empowered. You give them special powers so that they they can take down and destroy the institutions which obviously these Christian white men are using to gain power over everybody else because it's just bad institutions. It's not actually hard work or anything like that. And that's where empowerment comes from. 
And that's the main talking point of these women. And they go into some dark corners with this, let me tell you. Now, let's talk about this empowerment again for a second because it's very integral to their story. They're talking about empowerment of women, quite specifically, because they are movie producers. They produce horror movies, and their horror movies are centered around women and empowering women. And one of the things they talk about in this interview is that men, in doing things like hitting on women, are actually putting them in a situation of horror. These women who are getting hit on are in a situation of horror, and so these women need to be empowered in order to defeat that horror which is coming against them when they have to go through things like being hit on. And quite specifically, they're talking about empowering women because they go on from there to talk about the fact that when they have these scenes in their movies, a lot of guys just look at it and go, I don't get that. What is supposed to be going on here? But the women, they all shield their eyes and go, oh, that's horrible. Oh, I, I can't see. Why is she doing that to him? Because, of course, she's being empowered by getting out of the situation by doing something horrible to the man because it's a horror movie. See, that's how they empower the woman. So this is quite specifically what their movies are about. And this is quite specifically what this book is about. Because it starts off with Black Widow. You have Black Widow, and I haven't been following all the Black Widow story, so I don't know if this is new to this book or just new in general, because I think it's new in general. But Black Widow has found out that she's just a clone. And she has been a clone for a while, that is to say... The original Black Widow died a long time ago, and she was cloned, and that became the second Black Widow, and then she was cloned again after having died, and she doesn't even know what number clone that she is right now. And so Black Widow is going to go and try and find herself. Now, this would actually be a good story. It actually sounds like a good story premise. But how is she going to go and find herself? Well, if the writer was going to use something for such a story to say she's going to explore her humanity by actually doing horrible things, well, that might actually work. That might actually be a good story because they will be appealing to humanity, which everybody else can appeal to. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or white or non-white or Christian or non-Christian or anything else. Everybody who's reading this book is a human, therefore uh, appealing to humanity would actually make this story appeal to everyone but they're not doing that. Of course, being far leftists and ideologues, they're going to do it in terms of identity politics. It's going to all be centered around the fact that she is a woman, just like all the rest of their movies are centered around that idea where you have this woman in a quote-unquote horrible situation and therefore she gets empowered by doing horrible things to the men, specifically the men that have done horrible things to them. And that's the central core of this book. So what they do is these two sisters, they divide up the book. One of them came up with the concept of the book. And here we get into the depths of the mentally disturbed part as I see it. So the sister who came up with the idea of what the entire book was to be centered around came up with this idea. Idea. She thought of the most horrible way that Black Widow could kill a person, and then she decided to construct the entire story around that. And of course, when we say person, we mean man, because of course, that's how these two write everything. It's how Black Widow can most horribly kill a man or a bunch of men, and that is what the entire story is based around. That's how she finds her identity by doing these horrible things to these men. That's what the entire book is going to be centered around. And as off-putting as that sounds, let's go just a little deeper here and see what this writer, these two writers actually, did in order to construct everything around this story. Well, they had to figure out how Black Widow could kill someone in such a horrible manner and still look like a superhero. Well, of course, she has to kill the most horrible people on the planet. That's how she's going to get away with this in the story. So how did they decide who the most horrible people on the planet are? Well, and I'm going to have to use a little bit of soft language here because if I use the actual language for this, the YouTube algorithm will probably restrict my video. So. What they did was, these two sisters went into the darkest corners of the internet, into the dark web and other places in the internet, and steeped themselves in the milieu of these people who do the most disturbing things to women and children. 
that's what they did in order to write this book. They went and steeped themselves in that kind of mentality, in companionship, I would even say, with these kinds of ideas and possibly these kinds of people to understand how they work, to understand what these people are and how horrible they are so that they can put it in the book so that they can be the horrible thing which Natasha can then kill in a horrible, horrible way, the most horrible way that she can think of, and so reveal to herself what her identity is as a woman. This is the entire storyline and what it is based upon. And again, I have to say, this does not sound like a storyline to me written by a mentally healthy individual. It really does not. And of course, I haven't read the book because it hasn't come out, and I probably will take a look at it when it does come out. And if it ends up actually being a good story to any of you, I would say kudos to you, because it would probably be much more about the goodness that you bring to the table than the horrible nature of the creators of this actual product. So here's where I want to end up. Not only are we getting the sloppy seconds of the movies in these comics, which are just being used to prep everyone for a new movie that's going to come out in the future, but at the same time, I think there's something else that's coming into view here with this podcast. Because it appears in comics, and not just in comics, but around the world, 2018, I think, was the height of power for your SJW far leftist-minded people. And at the end of 2018, they started to realize that their grip is starting to loosen and people are not going to take it anymore. And that's what we've been showing them in the comics, that, you know, normal people want you to stop this ridiculous nonsense. And so what are your SJWs doing now that they're starting to lose a bit of control? Are they going to pay attention and listen to their audience? No. What they're going to do is they're going to double down. That's what they're doing. Especially, I would say, with these Sasuke sisters. So I would say, buckle up for 2019, because it's going to be one heck of a wild ride, since they're going to put creative control of their books into the hands of people like this. So... Hopefully I've given you something new to think about. If I did, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about this. All right, I'll see you later. Bye.